Hello and welcome to this video on the generalization typing rule in the Hindley Milner type system. This is part of a mini sub series about the Hindley Milner typing rules, which is part of a wider Hindley Milner series. If you haven't watched the previous videos, they will help in making this make some more sense. In those previous videos, we've looked at defining free variables. We've defined them in Hindley Milner types, so for type variables, type function applications, and for quantifiers, so the for all uh, polytypes. We've also defined them in contexts, so we've got a rule for empty context or a rule for a context that's not empty, so together we've defined it for contexts. And given that, we came up with some definition of generalization, which was based on if the variables were free in the context, um, then we could add them as part of our polytype to add the key, these free type variables. So let's take a look at the rule as we have for previous videos. We've got some expressions, we've got some types, and note the type at the bottom is this for all alpha uh, sigma. So we've actually added this for all alpha qualifier to the type. We've also got our assignments and then we've got some type variables. So we've got this type variable alpha. So by the premise at the top right, we know this alpha is not in the free variables of the context. And also we add it as a for all bound quantifier to the polytype sigma. As with previous videos, let's try and read through this. So we've got this if then construct from the rule. And so the first thing is a very simple, just assignment for following from the context. If from the context gamma, it follows that E has type sigma. And the second part we've already discussed a bit, but this is, and the type variable alpha is not free in the context, right? So we're saying FB of the kind of gamma is the free variables in the context. The in symbol or the kind of set in symbol, I've got a line through it, so that's not in. So it's not in the free variables uh, in the context. Basically, it's not free in the context. And we're looking for that variable alpha there. So provided that from the context gamma, it follows that E has type sigma and the type variable alpha is not free in the context, then we have the conclusion holding, which is from the context gamma, it follows that E has type for all alpha sigma. So we're just adding that for all alpha uh, to the sigma type because we already knew that E had type sigma. We can say E also has type for all alpha sigma, provided that alpha was not in the free variables in the context. Let's boil this down to its intuition. So if E has type sigma and type variable alpha is not free in the context, then we can for all quantify E's type sigma with variable alpha. To make that a bit more concrete without a full example, we can try out substituting some sample values in. So let's say we have a list of things. So we're gonna call this things and it's a list of things. We don't quite know what they are, but we'll say there's this variable T0, type variable T0 that is their type. And this T0 is not in the set of free variables in the context. Well, then we can say things has the type for all T0 list of T0, right? So we've added this for all quantifier T0 to our type because it wasn't in the free variables in the context. Intuitively, you might question, why are we looking at the things that aren't in the free variables of gamma? Aren't the free variables the ones that are, you know, we're free to use, free to do something with? But actually, this is kind of the different definition of free. So free is free as in not bound. But if they were bound, then they'd be scoped to that level. But because they are free, that means they're not really bound anywhere and they're globally scoped. So if we start binding them elsewhere where they're not already bound, then we lose this kind of connection between these two, right? Because maybe these are supposed to unify across different types in the context, but now we've added this qualifier that means they don't need to unify. So we can't be kind of removing these constraints using this rule. So they actually have to be not in the free variables context, which means basically they're only in this one specific place that we've seen so far. And that way we can have confidence to say, well, this can be any type whatsoever because I haven't seen it anywhere else. And therefore it doesn't have any other constraints on this type. So I can declare that it could be any type. So I can say for all this type. Continuing on, let's take a look at a practical example. We have a context gamma with our favorites, our assignments, age has type int and odd has type int to ball. And we're asking the question, what is the type of let id equals backslash x to x in id of odd id age, given the context capital gamma? So that's quite a lot. Let's break down that expression a bit. So we've got this let statement where we're saying let uh, this id, so we haven't defined this id function in the context anywhere, but we're defining it right now in our let binding. So we're saying id, this id function is going to be the identity function where we have 
backslash x. So we're taking in an x and then we're just returning an x, right? We've got an arrow to x. So let this identity function be the identity function in using this id function. So this identity of odd, which is going to then be applied to the identity of age, given this context capital gamma. And again, converting this into simple form, we get from the context capital gamma, let id equals backslash x to x in id odd id age is what type? On the next page, I'm going to jump straight to the type proof. If you are trying this yourself, I focus on the left half of the tree. If you go up that way, you'll find it's more interesting and you'll probably have to use the generalization rule. And if you don't find yourself using the generalization rule, remember that both function abstraction and let in bindings do not generate polytypes themselves. So this is what the proof looks like. At the bottom here, we have a let statement. So I've used the let rule. We've got on the left, the type for backslash x to x. And you'll find if you just use a monotype here, so for example, t0 to t0, it doesn't quite work. Because when you then try and work out the right hand side of the tree, when you work on unifying all the constraints, you'll find that, well, we've applied id to age, so well, the t0 has to match with the int. And we've also applied it to the result of odd id age, which is a bool. But then t0 has to unify with bool as well. And so it doesn't quite work. So what you need here is a polytype. So for example, for all t0, t0 to t0, because that way, you know, one time it can be int to int, and the other time it can be bool to bool. And we can instantiate it on the right-hand side when we need to. Focusing in on how we did this, we use the generalization rule. So here, the left is where we have that normal monotype uh, t0 to t0. We can work that out with the function abstraction and bar rules you can see on the top. And on the right hand side, t0 not being in the free variables of the context. Uh, and at this point, the context is just our original context capital gamma. t0 isn't in that. And so we're okay to for all quantify on the type of this expression. Hopefully this example made sense. If not, I'd really recommend you try and write out this whole proof tree and try out different things. The generalization and instantiation rules are quite difficult to get a hang of, especially the generalization ones, and also figuring out when you need to apply them unless you've already got experience doing this. So coming up with a few examples yourself and giving them a go might help. Otherwise, also continuing on to the videos about the Hindley-Milner algorithms that basically tell you how to apply these rules and in which order might help. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.